Hey everyone, it is time for another recitation, this time on the Auth Friends project. So, we're going to be going over how to do client-side authentication with JSON Web Tokens, as well as the different uh, REST verbs, which are post, get, put, and delete, and how we use those in our day-to-day uh, -day REST API that we're going to be encountering. So. Um, I have my project over on the left side. Here is the backend server at the root of the project. I've run yarn start and now I have my server listening on port 5000. I already yarn installed. And up here, I'm going to open another terminal. And I have uh, created my React app and installed the necessary dependencies, which have just been uh, Axios as well as. Uh, node SAS and React Router DOM. I don't think we're going to get to styling, but I was playing around with it uh, a bit right before we went live, so it's in there. Okay, so um, first I, I want to talk briefly about what a JSON web token actually is. So when we talk about client side authentication, uh, what we mean is the client keeps track of who's logged in. In server-side authentication, when you send a login request, they will usually send back a cookie that has some type of ID in it. And then when you make requests to the server, you'll send that cookie to it, it'll see that ID, and it will check some database that it has of uh, logged in users, and it'll see if that ID is currently logged in, and that's server-side authentication. With JSON web tokens, they're this big old crazy string. And, and what this actually is, is a base 64 encoded string. So, you know, we have binary zeros and ones. We also have hexadecimal, which is what we use for color codes, where we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then 10 is A, 11 is B, and so on up to 15. Um, this is base 64. So using our numbers and letters, uh, we get all the way from 0 to 63. Um, but if you were to unbase 64 this into just normal uh, letters, um, you actually get JavaScript objects. And a JSON web token has three parts. It has a header that talks about what the token actually is. And then it has this payload, which is information that the server sends along with the token. And this usually includes at least two pieces of info, some user ID to say who you are, and the literal date and time that this token is valid until. Um, and when you send this token to the server along with your requests, it will decode the token and it will check this time to see if this token is still valid. And if it hasn't occurred yet, then it'll let you through and you're logged in. So you, the client, keeps track of who is logged in or not. The server does not have uh, any kind of database checking that. Um, you might be wondering, well, what happens if I change this? Let's say I want to give myself some extra time to be logged in. We see on the left-hand side some changes have happened. This, this purple section, our payload, has obviously changed because we changed the contents of this, um, of this payload object. But also this final blue portion has changed. And this is a signature. It's a kind of fingerprint. Um, Using a hashing algorithm, we can take some kind of input, usually text, and then get some output, which is usually a big gobbledygook of letters and numbers. But if you always give it the same input, you get the same output. And there's no real way to go from this gobbledygook back into this input. And, and what this allows the server to do is when you uh, send the token, they will check to make sure that the payload matches the signature. They'll run the payload through the hashing algorithm again and try to get the signature. And if they don't match, then that means that you've modified the token and then the server sees it as invalid and it rejects it. Um, and the server also has a secret password that it uses when generating the hashes, so you can't do that on your own without knowing the, the secret key that the server uses. So that's what we mean by client-side authentication. You are literally keeping track of who is logged in or not. Um, and that's pretty neat. 
and you are you can on the client side decode this object and like get data out of here if you wanted to so that is a json web token um, but we want to actually use it so we have some documentation for our api here if we post this login endpoint um, with a username and a password which i am going to change real fast um, because I don't want to type that password <laughs> and username in a bunch of times. So I'm just going into the server JS and I'm finding where it has the hard coded username and password. And I'm just changing both of them to test to make it easy on myself. Okay. So now we can actually try to write our React application. So I'm going to go into my React app, friends, and source. And we're going to take a look at app.js. So here's our blank project. Uh, what we want to do is we want to put together a form that we can type the username and password into. And then when we submit the form, we want to post that endpoint to try to log in. So I am going to create a new directory called components. I'm going to create one called login.js import react and use state just like normal. And this is where we could have a lot of complicated decisions about architecturing and folder structure and routing. I'm going to do my best to keep that as simple as possible, as well as my state management solution. I'm just going to be doing plain old normal use state. We're going to see that that actually introduces some challenges when we're making all these requests that user or redux could help solve but they have their own overhead in writing them and i want to make sure we get to everything uh, so i'm just going to use normal use state um, our login is going to return a form element we're going to have some inputs in here input of type text name is going to be username um, placeholder will also be username and we'll make one of type password, and then I will switch over username to password. Um, and let's add a submit button for good measure. Uh, log in. Okay. So in my app, I can import the login component I've just written from the components folder. And we'll render that. OK, great. So now we have our login. And I spelled placeholder wrong. And there we go. There's our very ugly login form. Um, and we want to set up our managed form just like normal. I'm going to create a new state variable called creds. Uh, nope, that should be set creds, short for credentials. And let's do a use state. And I'm going to do something wrong here because um, I saw a lot of people doing this and I want to talk about the error message. I'm also going to write my handle change function. And this is going to take in an event. And what we're going to do is we're going to call set creds. We're going to provide an updated value of the creds object. So we're going to spread creds into a new object. And then I want to change the value of event.target.name. That's our key. And I'm going to give it event.target.value. And now I can add these as the onChange handler for both of these. And let's organize our props to be a bit nicer because I zoom in on my text when doing these and I have so few characters until I hit the, uh, the max width. Um, and then I'm also gonna give them a value and that's gonna be creds.username and also uh, creds.password. You could have used Formic for this and this would have simplified this setup and that is totally fine. So, um, this works, right? I can type into my form and it works and I have these values in state and this should be type password so we don't see our password. Um, but when I open my developer console, 
we'll see that as soon as I type into one of these, React throws this warning at us. It's saying a component is changing from an uncontrolled input to controlled. And what that means is that the input, when it was first set up, didn't have its value property set. And then, after the initial setup, its value property changed. And React doesn't like that. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, I do have the, the value property set right here. It's creds.username. Um, the problem is our initial state is an empty object. So creds.username is going to be undefined, which for the purposes of a React component receiving props, having a prop set to undefined and having a prop not be given is also going to give undefined. So this input does not know that you have tried to set its value. Instead, what we want to do is set the initial values on these. So we can do username, and this is going to be an empty string, or password, and that's also going to be an empty string. So now their value props are going to be set from the initial render, and when I type in them, I'm not going to get that warning. Okay, so we have our form set up, and when I click this button, I want to log in. So I'm going to write a handle submit function. And this is going to take an event and do event.preventDefault. And I'm going to add this as my submit handler before I forget, because I forget every single time. And now we want to actually perform the login. So we can import Axios from Axios. And here I'm going to make an Axios.post request. Like we do get, we do post. So I'm making an Axios.post. The URL that I want to send my post request to is HTTP uh, localhost colon 5000 slash API slash login. And then I also want to send some data. I want to send the credentials that I have. Because what the server expects here is an object with a key of username and a key of password. And luckily, by clever and thoughtful design, that's exactly what our form's object uh, that holds its value is set up to be. So I can give it my creds object. We chain dot thens on this just like normal. I'm going to get a response. And I'm going to console log the response. And I'm going to get a dot catch. And I'm going to get the error. And I will console log the error dot response. So we can see what's up. I have an extra R here. Err. <laughs> okay. So when we submit, we're going to send a post request. And we're going to console log the response either way. So your username and password was Lambda School, and then I believe I less than three L A M B D four. Um, I set mine to be test and test to make it easy on me. And so when I log in with this, I click uh, login. That's going to fire my handle submit, which is going to prevent the refresh and then make my post request. And we can see that I got a successful response. I got status 200, uh, which means success. And in the data that I got back, we see that the payload is set to our JavaScript web token. Those of you with sharp eyes might realize that this format is a bit different than the one I showed you here. And that's because as far as I can tell, this isn't a JavaScript web token. This is actually a random string of letters um, that is hard coded into the file, like the username and password. But it, it serves essentially the same purpose. We get this, this hunk of stuff, we need to save it and send it with our requests so the server knows if we're logged in or not. And let's see what an unsuccessful request looks like. If I try to log in with a username that doesn't exist, I hit login, and when we console log the error.response, we're going to get the response object that triggered the error. So we see a status that begins with four. That means a client-side error. That means there's something wrong with my request. 403 generally means forbidden. I'm not authorized to perform this action. Um, and we see that they, we actually have a nice error message here. Username or password incorrect. Please see readme. 
uh, it's good to console log this error.response and see this message so you know what you're doing wrong as opposed to just seeing error status code 403. Like, well, um, and you could also incorporate this error response into any kind of uh, form validation that you're doing or displaying errors. And that's something that Redux and UserDoucher help with, but I'm going to just skip now because it complicates my state setup. Um, okay, so there is our successful request and our failed request. What we want to do is we want to save the token into local storage. So I'm going to use local storage.setItem. I'm going to save it with a key of token, and its value is going to be res.data.payload, because if we inspect the uh, response object, we have our res object, the data inside of it, and then the payload is going to be our token. By saving this into local storage, we're able to persist the user's login session between refreshes, but also it's kind of a shortcut in terms of state management because we can now access the value of the login token from anywhere, even inside of functions that are not part of our components. You generally should not be using local storage as a, a state passing tool, but we do kind of get that here. One way around that is to, on the first load of your application, you can check local storage for the token and if it's there, you can put it inside of, you know, your reducer state or some other, you know, state that you're passing via context. And then always use the token out of state and surreptitiously save it into local storage. But that will only get read when the application is first started. But for now, using local storage to get this data everywhere we need it is okay in a quick application. So uh, do we have any questions so far? Okay, I, I see Jay has typed a question here. Can you explain why we need the square brackets around event.target.name and handle change? Yes, that is because the keys that we normally put before the colon are strings. This is just as a static string. All it is is test. If I had a variable, you know, called test, this would not be able to use the value of my variable. And even if I delete these uh, double quotes, this is still actually a string. We don't have to put double quotes out of convenience, but JavaScript does not know that I want to use the value of a variable named test and not a literal string test. So um, if we wrap it in square brackets, that alerts JavaScript to the fact that what I write in here should be the name of a variable or some JavaScript expression that we're running in order to get the value of the string to be used for that key name. So when we do event.target.name in here, we're actually allowed to use this JavaScript expression to get the name of our input from the event, and we're good to go. Forrest has asked, uh, sorry, one second. Uh, unexpected use of event. So if, if you're getting that global event things, that mostly means uh, you may have named your prop, uh, not your prop, your argument to handle change E or something like that. There is a global event object. That's why you're not getting event is undefined, but you are getting an error. So these would need to be consistent. I could make these all E. I could make them all event. I could make them all banana. I'm sticking with event. All right. And what was the other question? Just a quick follow up, Henry, on the bracket notation. Is mm -hmm. that doing for event.target.name like something analogous to what curly braces do for us in like JSX when we want to indicate that that's supposed to be JavaScript? Yes, very similar. It's a type of uh, escaping to allow us to use some JavaScript. Similarly, so the most similar syntax it is if I have an object and I want to get some key from it. I can't use a variable name here. This is a literal value that I'm getting out of my key. If I had a variable named key name and I wanted to use that, I would do object and then square brackets key name. And this would get the test property from my object. So that's, that's what this square bracket is really trying to be analogous to, is accessing properties from objects. But yeah, similar to, uh, to our, our template strings or our JSS escaping. Okay, uh, any other questions at this point? All 
All right, cool. Um, so we have our post request. Um, it's sending the data to the server. Uh, and now we're logging in. I want to involve some basic routing in here. So I'm going to set that up by going to my index.js. I'm going to import browser router as router from React router DOM. And I'm going to wrap my app inside of the router components. And now I can use routes. I'm going to switch back to my app.js. I'm going to import route from React Router DOM. And I'm going to put my login component inside of a route with a path of slash login. And the component is going to be my login component. So when my app refreshes, our form is going to go away. If I switch over to login, I get my form back. Okay, so uh, when this uh, login finishes and is successful, I actually usually want to redirect my user away from login and to some component that is, is going to then contain the data that they want to see after logging in. And we can do that by making use of the props that get passed when we use a route. So if I console log the props my login is receiving, we're going to see our old friends of uh, history, location, match. We can use this history object to perform uh, redirects by doing history.push. And we know when our request has been successful because we have a dot then block. This only gets run if our request has been completed successfully. If our request fails, we get our catch block and the then never runs. So I can put inside of here props.history.push and then I want to send them somewhere else. Let's go to slash friends, which I haven't written yet. And now if I try to log in with bad details, we're not going to get redirected. But if I log in with good details, yay, we get redirected to something that doesn't exist. And I really like destructuring my props, so I'm actually going to do that. Instead of doing props.history, I will use history.push. And I don't need to console log my props anymore. So there is our redirect on successful behavior. If we're using Redux, we generally want to find another way to do this. Perhaps we can, with a use effect, check and see if the loading variable related to that request has finished. Uh, you know, or if we set some kind of success thing in the state to let this component know that it is now time to redirect. There's also solutions for routing that we can involve within our reducer, but ultimately it's going to be pretty similar. So, um, any questions before we start building out our friends? I have a question. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I mean, you can go first if you want. Oh, okay. Um, I was just saying, I was just more um, curious to see how you would redirect the page without the form on there. Um, I, what, what, what do you mean without the form? Like without like, using... Yeah, I'm sorry. So when, when you log in, mm -hmm. um, I need the form to disappear. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, that that's what we're using our routing to do so when i i navigate to this friends location my login form only exists on the on the route slash login um so when we navigate away from that our login form disappears you if you don't want to use a routing based solution um you could use uh, some type of state variable to perform conditional rendering like if you know logged in is true then don't render this login component component, um, you know, if login is false, do, but you're going to end up basically performing an ad hoc solution for routing. And in some cases, that's fine. Like with a modal pop-up, you could do that with routing, or you could do that with a state variable to control whether or not you render the pop-up. Um, but generally in a case like this, where we're thinking about a component as an entire page, like our login page, we would use routing for this kind of solution. Got it. Okay. And what was the other question? 
Yeah, so I see that you're using like history dot push. I thought you could only use that if you render like if you do like render props. Um, so when we render a component with a route, it will automatically pass in the three props, history, match, and location. Uh, when we use a component, when we do a render function, what we're doing is we're specifying a function that takes in props and should return si some type of component. So in fact, this render function right here is going to be virtually identical to how the route actually works underneath the hood when it renders our component. And these props are going to be history, match, and location. What this render function allows us to do is pass additional props to log in. But if we're just doing the component on its own, then we don't have to specify a render function and route will will pass those props to the component anyway. Okay, I got one more. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> yesterday in the project, I wrapped my my like I did browser router as router and I wrapped my router in the actual app component instead of wrapping around the like on index.js. Mm -hmm. Does that matter or, or no? Not a ton. Um, you know, out of some convention, we tend to wrap things that um, interact with our entire application and index because that is the source of truth for what the entire application is. You might decide later to rename app, and this is actually, you know, some specific route and, and all of that. Um, but as long as we're wrapping, you know, everything that needs to use routes inside of the router, we could put that at any location uh, within our application. And in fact, if we look at the, um, the React Developer Tools, um, yes, that's fine. Uh, there we go. Um, we see that this, this router is actually a router.provider. It's, it's a context provider. Um, so as long as that is above any of our routes that use router.consumer, then that's totally fine. But out of convention, we, we prefer to put things like providing router and, and providing Redux state and stuff like that around our whole application if the whole application is going to use it. Okay, I'm, just one more. I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, you're good. <laughs> so, so doing it, doing it, when I when I wrapped it in, in index.js, it said something along the lines of when I wanted to do a link tag, it said something along the lines of, um, you have to, you you cannot do link tags outside of a router component. Yes. So that occurs if I were to uh to get a link here. This is going to yell at me in all kinds of ways. And then let's render some link to test. Um, and then I were to go into index.js and remove this router around my app. Now I'm going to get that error because um, we don't, we, the, we're getting errors because of the, um, we don't have that provider anymore, but also we get this error about the link tag because um, you know it only makes sense to do routing inside of that router, which controls our, our routes and the information they're in. So you might have been getting that error because maybe you were importing router directly and not importing browser router and renaming it. Maybe you hadn't saved index.js when um, you'd made those changes, or maybe you needed to refresh the, uh, the tab because the development server had disconnected or anything. But as long as there is a router at some point in the component tree around a component that uses link or route, you're good to go. So I'm, I'm guessing it was a, a small bug because this is categorically OK. All right. Any other questions? Uh, I actually had a quick question. Mm -hmm. Um, I ended up implementing like uh, my application with Redux, mm -hmm. and I ended up having to pass um, props, like so, like the history object within my uh, action creator into into my actions, I guess, to call history. Is there any other way to do that, or is that that just kind of what you have to do as it, far as like Redux? 
if you want to trigger those history actions within the action creator, then yes, it would have to receive those as arguments. Those are functions. They take arguments. They do what they need. Um, another option is to handle the routing within the component itself using um, use effect to check and see as the, the properties it's receiving from state change to see if that tells it when it is time to redirect. Uh, that's the solution we use with Formic when we're doing status to check and see if we need to do a, a redirect. And that's the pattern that you're going to more commonly see with action creators and Redux, where like, you know, if suddenly the logged in variable is, is set to true, then we want to, you know, redirect after that request is finished and our state has, has turned to true. Um, but either way does work. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, so let's get let's get our friends going. Let's get some friends. Um, so I am going to define another component here. Uh, I'm going to call it uh, friends.js. I'm going to import React and let's get um, use state and use effect as well. Um, I'm going to import Axios as well. And we'll define our boilerplate component, front fronds. <laughs> it's going to take in some props. Uh, let's return uh, a div with, let's put an H, H2 in here that says friends. And we'll export uh, default friends. We will import this inside of our app. I'm just going to copy this line and replace login with friends because I'm lazy. And now I'll render on a route the path slash friends, our component of friends. Um, I forgot to save this file. Okay, so now when I log in with my modified username and password of test, we get redirected to the, the friends route, and we now render our friends component. So uh, what we want to do in here is make the get request to the friends endpoint to get our array of friends and then render all of those. So I can do that using our traditional tools of use state. I'm going to make a friends list and set friends list. And I'm going to use as the initial value for here an empty array so I can map off of it even if my request isn't done. I'm going to put a use effect in here and we're just going to do this with the empty array because I want this to run when we've started this up. I'm going to make an axios.get request to HTTP localhost 5000 and some of you might be going whoa 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 you're not using axios with with auth this isn't going to work. That's correct it's not. <laughs> Um, so we make our get request to slash API slash friends. We're going to do our dot then, get the response object. I will console.log the response object. And we're going to do the same thing with a catch, where I get the error, and I'm going to console log error.response. Um, so what's going to happen here is when I save this, our page is going to refresh, which is going to trigger the use effect. Um, we're going to make that request and it's going to fail. And I wanted to show you this failure case because what we're getting is 403, which is forbidden. We're not authorized to, to view this route. Um, and the response we get is user must be logged in to do that. But I've logged in, haven't I? I, I sent my data to the server and it gave me 200 and it says we're all good. So why isn't this working? Well, it's because mm -hmm. you need to send your token. You control who is logged in or not. You, the client, have the, the authority here. So to let the server know that you have a valid token, you need to send that along with your request. And where that goes is in the request headers. So if we go into the network tab, and Chrome has a very similar one, we can actually see the requests that we make. And here's my 403 get request that fails. And there are these various header properties that get sent along with our request. Um, which contain things like the request method and the address and, and status codes and, and all of these 
um, and we can view the uh, request headers, the ones that I sent, and that contains some other li uh, information, like I want to accept uh, JSON formatted responses and other things like that. And this is where we include our authorization token, um, is in the request headers. And in Axios, uh, the, all of the methods either take two or three arguments. The first argument being the URL. The second argument uh, for post and put is going to be um, the whatever data we want to send to the server. And if that doesn't exist in, inside of our get and delete requests, for example, then the second or third argument, the last argument, is going to be a configuration object that allows us to set headers and various other properties about our request. So this is where I could do, uh, I could include this object. I'm gonna set a key in this object called headers. And then I'm gonna set a key within the headers object called authorization. And its value is gonna be my token, which is local storage .get item and my token. So this is going to send that request to the server with that login token. And now when we watch the network tab, uh, we see that my request to friends should succeed. And did it not? Let's see, let me check my console. Yes, it did succeed. Um, so we get status 200, which means we're all good. And we see the data contains all of our friends. And this is what we're using Axios.create to do, is to create a version of our Axios requests that already contain this header put in, so I don't have to manually do this at each point. So I, I think I heard someone unmute themselves. Uh, did, did someone have a question? So is that the same as uh, Axios with all? Yeah. Um, file? Yeah. So to avoid having to write this a bunch of times, that's where we use axios.create. So I'm going to create a folder called utils. And then here, I'm going to create my file axios with auth.js, import axios from axios. And when we define our axios with auth function, um, what we're doing is we return axios.create, which allows us to create an Axios request that is yet unfinished, where we can set certain properties about the request, like its headers. So I can take this configuration object that I included in my get request and cut it out of there, and instead give it to axios.create, and this is going to return an, an Axios request kind of in progress where the authorization header has been set in order to perform uh, requests that require us to be logged in. And this is good because we could do this when making any request, but we're gonna see ourselves copying and pasting this object over and over again. And instead of copy and pasting, we should generally try to write a function to avoid repeating ourselves. And that's what we're doing here. We're writing a function that adds this configuration object, including our header, to any requests that need them. So now, instead of importing Axios, well, first I need to export this. I'm going to import Axios with auth from dot dot slash utils and Axios with auth, the file that I need to save. There we go. And so now I can use this in place of Axios. And I guarantee, because I do it still, is you're gonna write it like this. You replace Axios with Axios with auth. All is good in the world, right? No crazy error shows up. Give it a second. Yeah, oh, it's saying things about Webpack, I don't know. But um, ultimately what this is doing is it's trying to tell us get is not a function. And that's because Axios with auth is a function that we've defined that returns the Axios request with the configuration. So I need to call this in order to get that Axios so request. So what, what is, uh, is Axios.create? 
create? What is that return? So axios.create returns an axios request object that has the configuration options set. So you know how we, we normally do axios.get? What axios.create does is it returns something that is going to work exactly the same as plain axios, but it has certain configuration options set already. So this is essentially what we're doing. I could, instead of adding the configuration object as the second argument here, I could add it to this call to create, and then chain my dot get off of that. It's just another way of passing the configuration object. But this is now easy for me to automate because I can do this part inside of a function and then chain my get request off of that. And that's exactly what I'm doing with Axios with auth. So that is, that is what we're doing there. And this has to be a function rather than some of you might think, oh, but what if I do Axios with auth and just set this equal to Axios.create? The problem is this code is going to be run once when the function is defined, whereas we want to run this function and get the most updated possible value of our token in local storage rather than whatever value was in local storage when we defined this file. So that is, uh, that's why it has to be a function. All right, any other questions with uh, Axios with auth? All right, so there we go. Now we have our request set up. Uh, if we look at the response object, we're getting um, inside the data our array of friends. So what I want to do is set my friends list to be res.data. And now I want to display those friends. So I'm going to do friends list dot map. Um, I'm going to take in a friend object. And then I want to return. For now, I'm just going to return a div with the friend name in it. And this is going to work, but I'm going to get that warning about using keys. Thankfully, most of the time when we make a request to an API, the resources we're going to get back have unique IDs. So it's as easy as doing key is equal to friend.id. And there we go. Now we have our friends rendering from a GET request um, that we have to do authentication in order to get. But what happens if we are not authenticated? Well. If I go into storage, which in Chrome, this is under application, um, and go to my local storage, and then my local host, we can see that I have this token in here, and the cart from that project. If I delete that token from local storage, then we're no longer logged in, right? We keep track of who's logged in, and when we discard that token, we've essentially ended our session although it's a little bit more complicated than that if you actually want to log a user out early and prevent them from like copying the token down and putting it back in local storage. But that's a uh, topic for another day. And so now we can see when we make this request, we're getting 403 forbidden. There's a lot of ways to handle this. One is we could inside of our dot catch see that, that when we make a request that returns 403 forbidden, that we could now redirect the user to log in because we know if they're getting a 403, then they're not authenticated and we can shoot them back out to log in. There's other ways of telling if our user is logged in. Um, as a good first check for being logged in, we can just see if there's a, a token stored in local storage, because if there isn't, then we know unequivocally that the user is not logged in because they have nothing to send with their requests to prove that they're a logged in user. However, we're not going to go in depth trying to check and see if the token is valid for login. Um, we're just going to check to see if it's there, and that's good enough. And this is where we get into our protected routes. So we can prevent the user from ever being able to navigate to the friends endpoint if they're not logged in with our protected routes. So I'm going to switch over to app.js, 
And I'm going to write my protected route right in here. We can move it out to another file if we want. Um, so it's going to be a component called protected route that is going to take in some arguments. Um, it's going to take in a component as an argument, which we're going to destructure and rename like this. You know how when we're doing our imports, we can rename with the as keyword? That's slightly different than renaming while destructuring. We do that with the key name colon and then what we want to rename the value of that key to be. And then we can use our spread operator dot 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 rest to get all of the other uh, properties passed into here inside of this rest variable. So, yeah, Henry, how would you how would you uh, pass in the arguments without destructuring? Is there another way to do it? Um, we could just get the props, right? This is this is just a component. It's accepting props. The structuring makes it a little bit easier because we know what we're talking about. But I can show you it with just plain props, and then we can switch over to destructuring. So ultimately, what we want to do is we want to return a route a route component, that is. And I want to give it all of the props, but I don't want to give it a component. So I would have to add a, another key here, component, and this is going to be undefined. There's other ways of, of getting um, this outside of the, uh, the thing. Oh, it doesn't like this because to do this, technically we would have to spread this into a new object and then spread that. You can see this is starting to get complicated with just plain props because we want everything but component. And destructuring allows us to do that in, in a very expressive way. Whereas this, not super readable. I can make an intermediate variable props without components. And that's going to be a new object of props without our components. Those of you that know about the del keyword, we can use that here as well. Um, because what I want is basically to change this route to say protected route and for it to work exactly as I imagine it to, where it's not going to display this route unless the user is logged in. If they try to go to this route without being logged in, it'll redirect them to login. So what we're doing is we're basically providing a shallow wrapper around route where we give it all of these props, any path, maybe exact, maybe other configuration options I have for my route. I don't know how to handle that. I'm going to let route handle that. But I want to provide some logic wrapping the component that I've given. So this is where we would give route. Let me change this. Props without the component. And then I want to define uh, the render prop, because this allows me to write some logic that we're going to use when rendering our component. I want to render the component, which is currently at props.component, which is bad form because this should be capital, um, and that's why we do the renaming. And um, But I only want to do this conditionally. I only want to render this component if a user has logged in. So I want to write something like if user is logged in, then, oh, it's going to hate that. Well, let's, let's fix it really fast. Um, so if the user is logged in, I want to return my component with any props that the route is trying to give it. All right, we get our props from our render function and we spread those in. If the user is not logged in, then I want to redirect them, which in the past we've done using history.push, but there is also a component that React Router DOM has provided for us called redirect. And if we ever render the redirect component, it will automatically redirect the user to wherever that component says. So if the user is not logged in, the code for that I have not written yet, we want to redirect them to slash login. All the logic we're going to use here in this if statement is to check and see if they have a token. We don't know if the token is valid. We don't know if the server is going to accept that. 
but we do know the negative case with uh, exact uh, knowledge. If they don't have a token, then they cannot be logged in. So this else is always going to be correctly dispatched, but we're going to have some false positives, which we would solve with like a 403 redirect situation or some other type of method. But for now, I'm just going to check if the local storage dot get item for our token returns a truthy value. If an item is in local storage, then this function is going to return the string, which is truthy. If it's not in local storage, then the local storage dot get item is going to return null, which is falsy. So now I have a route set up where we only render this component if the user is logged in, has a token. Otherwise, if they're logged out, they don't have a token, they're going to be redirected to our login page. And this should work. If I save this page, I think I have everything set up correctly, such that now when we refresh, um, we're going to hit the friends um, uh, route. We're not going to have a token because I deleted it. <laughs> um, and we get redirected to login, which is what we see here. And we can use destructuring to make this a little bit simpler. I want to get the component. And then I want to get everything that is not that component. So instead, I would spread in the rest of my props. And I could use the capital component with good form as it is capitalized. And those are going to do exactly the same thing. With slight differences because of how destructuring actually works. But we're ignoring those. Um, all right. So do we have any questions on how this protected route works? So we don't necessarily need the, what do you call it, exact path? So we use exact when we only want to render a component on the exact path. Like if I do login slash something else, we're still going to render the login component because we get a partial match here on login at the start. If I only want this to show up on exactly slash login, nothing after, then I use the exact keyword. Most commonly, we see the exact keyword when we're putting a route uh, with a path of just slash, just that loot slash, because um, that will always get a partial match. We'll always get a partial match because that's just our website. Uh, if we put exact in there, then it will only render when the URL is exactly just that root slash. So now with the exact keyword, we don't render login on login slash something else. But if I just go to login, then it's going to show up. All right. Any other questions here? Uh, if you just call that. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And this, this is literally in the training kit. Um, let's find protected. Route. Oh, is it not in the training kit? It's uh, Dustin showed it in lecture, I believe. Oh, he called it private route, not protected route. Uh, so yes, what I wrote here is in the training kit. He used a ternary, which I like, and, and we could have used to simplify this if statement a bit, but they, they do the exact same thing. So yeah, uh, there's another way of doing this that I want to touch on briefly, and that's using our uh, higher order component style thing where um, because the problem with this is this works great if we're just passing in a component to render but what if I need to pass some props to friends well then I want to write a render prop and this is you know gonna do the whole thing where we're gonna uh, render friends and give it some other props and uh, now we have to figure out how to handle that within this protected route and that's just gonna get like a smidge complicated um, so instead, what we can do is write this higher order component style function that I'm going to call protect route, which is going to take in a component. And then what it's going to return is exactly, <laughs> exactly our previous if statement. So the idea here is that we've created a, a higher order component. 
And now I can reuse um, all of my previous logic with a normal route. But the component I'm going to be render rendering is the protect route version of friends. And I would actually want to do this up here so that I only do it once when this page is initially uh, loaded and parsed. So protected friends, I would uh, protect this route of friends. And then the component that I would render is protected friends. And I saw some people have some issues with infinite reload loops when passing props in here with render props. and. That's because it was triggering unmounting and remounting because it thought it was a different component and that would trigger your use effect, which would cause state to change, which is going to trigger another unmount and remount. So this can get uh, just a smidge complicated. Um, oh, I'm sorry. What we actually want to return here is a function that takes in props. This is our, our higher order component. And then this component that we've returned wraps the, the logic for either rendering our component or redirecting. Um, so that is the, the higher order component style, where we take a component as argument and then we return another component as a result of that. So another way of, of handling protecting routes. I'm sure there are, are more. I'm sure there are infinitely more ways of solving these problems, but different trade-offs with each. Because now with this, I am absolutely allowed to do render with it because route just sees protected friends as another component. It does not realize that it contains the logic to, to do anything, you know, with redirecting. That's just what that component does is if I had written it that way, always. So wanted well, to show is, you that. Is redirect uh, imported? Yes. Redirect is imported from react router DOM. And if, if you ever render a redirect component, it will cause that redirect to happen. So that's another option as opposed to, to history.push where you can use state variables to do conditional rendering to render redirects. Um, and that allows you to perform redirects in components that don't necessarily receive history.push as an argument, like our app component. It doesn't get the history object. It's not in a route. So you can use the redirect to do that. And there are other tricks too, but the redirect one is good. Um, yes, Joshua, I can post the code. I, I generally move at a, a fairly quick rate, um, and I don't always expect people to be able to keep up when coding along just because, it, you know, I'd have to slow down significantly, so I'm sorry if I outpace you. Um, the code is always posted afterwards, and uh, oftentimes the way I got the most out of this was not to code along, but just to, like, take notes and kind of watch what's happening. Um, you know, and, and try to think about the, the why we're doing these things rather than the exact syntax, which I can look up later. But to each their own. I don't want to suggest that you're doing anything wrong, just that I know I'm going too fast and I don't have the luxury to really go slower because we're already into project time and uh, we haven't even hit MVP. So I don't want to take up too much extra time. So... That is our protected route situation. Uh, any questions here before we start actually implementing the, uh, the friend stuff? Okay, so I'm going to log back in, get my token and local storage. So this all works. Now I'm going to uh, add a form to my friends so we can add friends. Um, and we may want to do this inside another component. And in fact, when we do the put, yeah, let's do this inside of a, another component. So um, I'm going to make a new component that I am going to call friend form. Do I want it friends form or, or friend form? Let's do friends form. No, let's do singular, friend form. Okay. I'm going to import react and let's do our uh, use state from React, and we're just going to make another form, not using Formic for this. So friend form is going to take in props. I'm going to return a div for now, and then I'm going to export my default friend form. All right, 
Now I can import this within my friends component. And sometimes uh, one of the things I don't have the luxury to, to completely touch on right now is sometimes we like to logically separate components that we view as pages from components we view as you know a componentized part of a page. Uh, oftentimes we'll use another directory than component called like views or pages or something like that. And that's where friends would go and friend forms would go in a component directory instead. So um, we now have this imported and I can render my friend form. Oh, shoot. Uh, I need to backtrack just a second because I did want to talk about this. Um, if you're using use reducer or redux and you get to this pattern where you are, this web page is slowing down my browser. Well, of course it is. I wrote it. It's terrible. Um, never seen that error before. Did I did I make an infinite loop or something? Ooh. Yeah. Maybe I just need to force a reload. Um, huh. Well, let's stop it, and I'll figure that out in a second. Uh, if if you have this use reducer or Redux pattern, um, in the in the previous applications we've written with that. Uh, they were single page applications, not SPAs, but like literally just, you know, app did did one thing. And so we'd hook app directly up to Redux. Um, if you have multiple views, multiple routes that represent entire pages, generally it's going to be um, a better pattern to hook up those routes to Redux or use context to pass those props to help eliminate some of the difficulty of having everything defined inside of your app and then needing to pass everything with props, we have the nice connect and use context tools to enable us to kind of shortcut the props passing within there as our application grows larger. So I have my friend form. Let's open up friends.js and let's try to figure out why my browser is, uh, is getting mad at me. So we'll go to localhost 3000 Huh. Let's uh let's try opening up Google Chrome and we'll see if if it is not liking my page. Oh, oh gosh, I did create an infinite loop. I tried to import friend form from friends, so I was just creating yeah, an infinite import loop here. Um, if I fix that, then localhost 3000 should work. Uh, and we render nothing on the root. If I go into friends, yay, there we go. And I'm going to put my friend form in right above this list. We could also use some sub routing here. Uh, not going to go into that because I want to try to finish this up. Um, so our form is going to render a form. We're going to have some inputs. Um, name, I believe. Placeholder. Um, uh, age and email. Um, so let's do our whole thing. I'm going to set up a state with a friend and set friend. Use state. I'm going to use this where name is set to a string, uh, email set to an empty string, and age as well. And then we're going to use the value on here for uh, friend.name. And I'm going to clean this up a bit. I'm going to write the handle change function, which this is a great use case for higher uh, uh, custom hooks because I have to keep writing this even though I have multiple forms that do the literal exact same thing. Um, so it's going to take in the event and I'm going to set friend uh, to uh, a new copy of friend but using the event dot target target dot name and its value is going to be event dot target dot value. And then this is going to get an on change handler. All right, I'm going to copy and paste this, and I want to show you an error that undoubtedly some of you have done. Where, okay, I'm going to replace name with email. The problem with this is you end up replacing 
the name prop with email, which is not what we want. So that still needs to be name, even though its value is email. So you're welcome for saving you hours of pulling your hair out. And now I can change email to age with no issue. And let's do a button and call it add friend. Okay, so now we should see our form show up with our things in here, and I should be able to type, and it should work. Sick. Um, so we want this to then post the friends endpoint to add a new friend. Because with our different rest verbs, we have get, which gets data from an endpoint. And generally, we have our API organized uh, where each route represents a resource. So friends is a resource. That's a type of, of data that exists on our server. If we get slash API slash friends, the server will generally return to us all of the friends, right? I want to get all the friends. We can also get specific friends, API slash friends slash some ID, and it will give us the data for that one friend, an object rather than an array of objects. When we post this friends resource, we're asking to add a friend onto that list, right? And it's the same URL because these verbs allow us to engage in different interactions with the same resource. This friends resource, I want to add one to it, so I'm going to post it. If we want to modify a friend, it doesn't make sense to try to modify slash API slash friends because that's all the friends. Instead, we send put requests, a request to modify data, to slash friends slash some ID. The same way we can get an individual friend, I can modify an individual friend with my put request. Same with delete. Sometimes you'll be able to delete the whole resource slash API slash friends, delete all the friends. More commonly, you will use delete to delete an individual friend. Friends slash that friend's ID. And that's the general format of the APIs you're going to be seeing and writing at Lambda of, you know, some resource. You can perform certain operations, getting and posting to the entire resource, and then slash the IDs, and that will be operations on individual versions of that resource. So getting an individual friend, putting, modifying an individual friend, and deleting an individual friend. Whereas we get and post the entire resource to get and add, respectively. Uh, any questions with that kind of setup? Okay, so um, I am going to do my friend form, and I want to keep this form dumb. We've got state within friends, and it's, it's fine. We don't have to have all our state within app. We just generally want to try to write as many components as we can, uh, you know, as simply as they can. Friend form has its local state, but it doesn't need to know about friends list and all of, all of the API stuff going on with there. Um, so I'm going to write inside of friends a function called uh, add friend. And this is going to take in a friend object. And friend has now stopped looking like a word to me. And we're going to do a request. We're going to do Axios with auth. But instead, it's going to be a post request to the friends endpoint. And the data that I want to send along is this friend object we expect to receive as an argument. Uh, yes, I will be posting the video afterwards. I'm going to console log the response. It's very important to know the shape of your data. And then we're going to do the same thing with catch error dot response and now I can pass this as in prop to friend form so give it a prop called um, we'll call this actually um, uh, submit handler because I'm going to reuse this for posting so the submit handler is going to be add friend and then my friend form is going to take in a prop I'm going to destructure because I like that called submit handler. Uh, I don't want to call that submit handler. What do I want to call this? Um, let's call it submit friend. That's good. Let's call this submit friend. Because I need to write my own submit handler. 
I guess we would call that handle submit, but I don't want to get the, the names too familiar, too similar. So I'm going to get the event here. I'm going to call event.prevent default to prevent refreshing when I do my form. I'm going to add this as the unsubmit handler because I want to forget it so bad. Oh, you, you do not believe the urge I have to forget that step. Um, and then now we're going to call submit friend. And I'm going to give it the friend object that I have in my local form state. That's going to get passed to this function, which is going to make the request that this form is, you know, here to with unaware of. And so I should be able to type in a friend here. I see there's some stuff in the Zoom chat. It's very difficult for me to read that. Um, if you want to post that in Slack, uh, I, can, I can see that. Submit friend is not a function. That's because I forgot to save this file. Okay, so let's just try to add a, a garbage friend. Okay, so it didn't do anything because I'm not actually doing anything with the request other than console logging it. So let's check out this console log. We see that I get status 200, so that means I did something right. Um, and if we look inside the data of the request, we see that it is the array of all of the friends with our new friend added onto the end of it. There is no guarantee on the type or shape of data that the server might return. Oftentimes when you post a, a friend or some other resource, you will get back an object for what you had just created. Here, they give us back the array of all of the friends with the new one added, and that makes our state management very easy because we don't have to worry about either adding that individual fringe object onto the end of our state or triggering another get request to get all the updated data. Um, here they make it really easy for us. So what I want to do in my add friend function with the then is I want to call set friends list and I want to set that equal to res.data. So now when I add this friend and click add friend, we will see we get the updated state as soon as that request finishes and we have our new friend. Now you might have noticed that the previous friend that I added just disappeared. Um, if we look in the terminal where we got the backend server running, notice that this says nodemon instead of node. And nodemon is a program that watches uh, files for changes. And whenever it sees a file change, it's going to restart our server. And that's very useful when developing APIs because if you make a change to the API, you don't want to have to come and kill it and restart it. You want that hot reloading that the Yarn Start server has for our React applications. And that's what Nodemon does. The problem is in its file watching, because our React project is a subdirectory of uh, where our backend server lives, Whenever we change one of the files in our React application, it's going to refresh the server. The server isn't actually connected to a database, so whenever the server restarts, it resets to the initial you know, state that it has in memory, so it doesn't persist any of the users that we're adding. Um, and, and that is the correct behavior. I know some of you were worried about persisting that data. That belongs on, on the server side end. Um, if I had just started this with Node, server.js and then let me refresh this page and I can add in a friend that will show up and if I refresh this page that friend will still be there the problem is with the node mon we have set up basically every time we change a file which is frequently we're gonna lose those previous friends so that's fine and that's what's going on there so we have our get, we have our post, that's an MVP. I want to briefly talk about our other requests. Uh, I know I've gone over, feel free to jump out and uh, watch the video later if you'd like, um, or just have it on in the background while you're doing your afternoon project. Um, so we make our, our put and delete requests generally to a specific friend, a, a friend slash this ID. I'm going to do the delete request first because it's just a smidge easier, just a, just a smidge. Um, so what we can do here is I'm gonna build out an actual component for one of my friends. 
So I'm going to make a new file called friend card. .js. I'm going to import React from React. I'm going to make my friend card. It's going to take in props. I would like to use this time to talk about other uh, topics while I'm just typing out the boilerplate, but you would not believe how hard it is to try to maintain a train of thought while typing different stuff. Like, I kind of feel like throwing up. <laughs> um, so now I have my friend card built out. We're going to receive a friend as a prop, and I really like destructuring, as hopefully you do now with uh, Monday's project where you're looking at foreign code and being able to see the props right at the top is super nice. And now I'm going to render uh, my friend.name, my friend.email, and the friend.age. Just really simple. Now I'm going to import this within the friends file. So I'm going to import friend card from dot slash friend card. And instead of mapping and creating these divs, I'm going to instead create a friend card. Yes, Kevin says that he likes to structuring now that I've drilled it into his head. I do like that I have a bit of an opportunity here to uh, kind of showcase stuff that I like um, and help give you exposure to, to some more things so you have familiarity with it. So I'm going to pass it the, the friend object as a prop. And now we're going to be rendering these neat little cards that's uh, essentially nothing <laughs> uh, for each friend. I'm going to add to this a button that says delete. And the idea here is when we click on this button, we should delete this friend. This is going to work very similarly to the kind of toggling behavior we had on to-dos or any kind of other delete operation. I'm going to hide it from this friend card. It's going to be dumb. I'm going to implement the delete friend um, function within the, the higher level friends component, not higher order, higher level in the, in the component tree, um, and then pass it into the friend card as a prop. And it's going to be very similar to the toggling function for uh, our to-dos because we need to give it the ID of the friend we want to delete. So this delete friend function is going to take in an ID, and for now, let's just console log that ID and I will pass this delete friend function as a prop down to the card. Delete friend is going to be equal to delete friend. And let's organize our props. And now I can add an onclick handler to this button. And what it's going to do after I destructure the delete friend prop is it is going to make a callback that calls delete friend with my friend.id, so the ID of the current friend being rendered. And so now we should see when I click on these delete buttons, we'll console log the ID of that friend. Yep, there we go. So we can use this information to make our delete request. So I'm going to make another request inside of delete friend. It's going to have to be Axios with auth, and instead of being a post, it's going to be a delete. And we don't need to send any data along with the delete request. We just need to specify what we want to delete. I don't want to delete all the friends. I want to delete the friend with this specific ID. The way we lay out our APIs usually is we would do friends slash whatever ID. And so I can use a template string here to do our API slash friends slash and whatever ID I was passed in. Then I'm going to get my response object, and I'm going to console log the response. Otherwise, I'm going to catch the error and console log the error.response. And I realize I spelled this wrong. Response. So now when I click this button, I should delete this friend. And so let's, let's get Dustin out of here. Goodbye, Dustin. Um, and so we see I get uh, status code 200, which means a successful request. And if we look inside of data, I have all of my friend objects minus Dustin. 
So again, the server has made it very easy for us to update our state. Most of the time, when you delete an individual resource, like a, like a single friend, you will get back either that object or a response with a status code 204, which means successful and no data. Because you deleted a thing, generally you don't need that information, that's why you deleted it. Um, so what we can do here is we can set our friends list to be res.data. If we didn't have this nice setup, then instead we could do like friends list dot filter and check, you know, for the ID and remove the one that we had just deleted, or we could trigger another get request here. Inside of this dot then, we know that we have finished our delete operation and it is successful. And so by virtue of defining uh, our get request inside of a function instead of in the use effect, I can make a function called get friends. And this is going to perform our get request and update our state. And now I can call this in use effect, but I could also call this as soon as my delete operation is finished. And this will kick off a get request that will get the updated data and update our state. And so that's a very easy, perhaps inefficient way of doing state management. Um, and if you're trying to put an app together quickly to hit MVP, that's okay. We don't have to do it right on the first time. It can be valuable to know the tricks that'll get it working and then do the more efficient version of state management when you have time. But here, our API has been very nice to us and I can just do set friends list and give it the res.data because it already gives us back the array with everything but our missing friend. So when I now try to delete Dustin, boop, pops right out. There's our delete and I can get rid of everyone except me. Now I'm king of Lambda school. I think that's how that works. Um, okay, so do we have any questions here? I kind of ran for a long time there. All right, I see Jocelyn typing. Can you, can you show me the uh, set friends list function again? Yep, so that is just coming right from my use state. Just setting the the array that I keep. Okay, okay, okay. You yeah, you could you know if if we had used uh, you know use reducer or Redux, then it would be pretty much as simple as changing set friends lists to be you know dispatch or yeah. um, you know something in order to to send that off to our reducer and have that, and we would define these functions as action creators with Redux thunk and hook it up via props. Um, but I'm just using normal state right now. Okay, uh, any other questions here? Uh, I actually had a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever we perform like an Axios request, we're doing something to the server. Yes. But we're also setting something to state so then our front end also updates. Yes. Is that the why that we do something like mm -hmm. we manipulate I suppose. Yes, because if I uh, if I were to not update friends list here, um, you know, if I were to instead just like console log the the res object, the delete operation would still work. Um, so like I can delete Dustin, and I get two hundred from my server, so Dustin has been deleted. The problem is my application doesn't reflect that. The state of my server, which is the source of truth for our application, has become out of sync with the front end, which is how we try to view that and interact with that data. If I refresh the page, that's going to trigger another get request, and we'll see that Dustin is gone this time. But that's generally not the behavior that we want. We want to click this delete button and see the delete happen. So that's where we as the front end developers have to put in the footwork of making sure that the data we're showing the user matches the data on the server. And we can do that easily by just making get requests whenever we modify the data on the server so that we always have the most up-to-date data. But we can also do our own operations. Like if I know we deleted a, a friend with this ID, then I can filter my state and remove that friend. 
And perhaps we could do that even before performing our, um, our Axios request. So the user gets immediate feedback. And then we make the request, and as long as the request passes, you know, eventually the user feels like they have done the thing. But in that case, we would want to then check in, in case the request failed and then show the user that, you know, it had failed and, and help uh, rectify that situation. But um, we can handle it a bit simpler by setting our friends list as a result of the request and keeping our state up to sync that way. Up to sync is not a phrase. Up to date, um, and that's and that's how we get that that user response feedback as we delete these. Um, oh. Welcome. Uh, any other questions here? Okay. Um, let's do editing real quick. I know this has gone really long. Um, but editing is going to work essentially the exact same way it did back in the friend project. Um, I think that's, or was it called team builder? The, the project where you had to do editing uh, for the first time within your state and it was like very hard. But now we just did routes and made a whole bunch of forms and API requests and it's like, yeah, no big deal. So I can promise you all are improving. Um, so what we can do is I'm going to do some sub routing in here. So I'm going to add to my friend card a link. I'm going to import a link from React Router DOM. And I'm going to add a link here uh, to somewhere I haven't decided yet. And this link is going to say edit. And we could perform editing in a whole bunch of ways. Um, we could do the, the style of editing that Dustin's done in lecture a few times where when we click on, you know, edit, it switches the, from the display, like our divs and H1s, into inputs that we can type in and then submit. Um, I'm going to keep it a bit, uh, kind of a bit simpler, kind of not. I'm going to use routing instead, just because that's another pattern that we can do this with. And what I'm going to route to is friends slash edit and then the friend's ID. So I'm going to turn this into a template string. And then I'm going to use my friend.id. And now I can perform routing to render the editing form and also have that keep track of, you know, which friend I'm editing because that's going to be part of our match data. So um, now these friend cards are going to have uh, this edit link and when I click that we see that we have this edit show up I want this to hide my uh, add friend form so um, what I'm gonna do in here is uh, put this inside of a route so I'm gonna import route from react router dom and this is one way of doing sub routing is that um, we can just do it wherever we feel like it. So I'm going to make a route. The path is going to be slash friends, but it's going to be exact. And I'm going to put in here a render, um, and this is going to take in props, and it is going to render our friend form. And it's going to give it any of the additional props that it needs from this route, which we're not using, but good habit to get into. Um, so now when we're editing, we no longer see that uh, add component. But if I go back to just friends, we're going to see that add component. And I can do a very similar thing for editing. I'm going to add in another route, and this time the path is going to be slash friends slash edit colon ID. We want to match the ID out of the URL that we're using to link. And we're going to edit uh, we're going to render a friends form, but this time the submit friend is going to be a different function. That's why I wanted to name it generally. We're going to write an edit friend function. So what we're going to do here is we'll copy add friend because it's going to be very, very similar. And instead, we are going to take in, uh, we're going to call this function edit friend. We're going to take in a friend object, but instead of posting, 
we want to modify existing data on the server. So that's a put. Post is new data, put is modify. And we need to change the URL that we're putting to because that's how we specify which friend we're editing. So I'm going to use a template string for that and I'm going to put in the friend.id out of that friend object. And so um, now I'm able to put that specific friend with the ID in the URL with my updated friend object. Maybe I want to call this edited friend, you know, to make it a bit more clear. Um, but I'm just going to leave it as friend. Uh, so it's shorter for now. And um, if we console log the response data, again, it's going to return the entire array, but with our updated friend in it, most of the time you're just going to get back the edited object and you'll have to resolve the state difference uh, using some other way, but we can just set the whole response data and that's our put. That's it. All there is. Um, the issue is, if we are editing this friend, how do we get the data to our friend form? And this is going to be using the exact same trick I did with that project back in the day, where I can, um, I'm actually going to make this uh, an explicit return. I can find the current friend data using the props that I'm getting here, which is going to contain our match. So if we search our friends list and find uh, a friend where their ID, friend.id, I'm using double equals here because that will allow us to match uh, an integer ID, which is what this friend object has, to the URL match ID, which is going to be a string. Double equals does type conversions which generally we don't want, and we do triple equals. I'm going to use that to our advantage here, though. Um, and we're going to do props.match.params.id. Is that correct? Let me console log the props here. I haven't used React Router in, in a bit. So we're going to see, um, when I click Edit here, uh, if we look, that is going to be props.match.params.id. Okay, so that's correct. So now I'm able to get my current friend, and um, I am going to render the friend form, and I, I'm going to pass in um, uh, initial values as a prop, and I'm going to give it the current friend object that we have. Doing this, I can, I've split my window and I'm now gonna open the, uh, the uh, friend form component back up. I can, when I do my initial use state, I can check and see if I have initial values as a prop. And if that does exist, I will use that instead of the default empty value for friend. So now, when I click this edit, um, it should have populated this form, but it hasn't. I probably have a typo or have done some silly thing. So let's console log current friend and make sure my find is working. <coughs> oh, I actually know what the issue is. Um, it's because uh, when we refresh this page, um, the the state hasn't populated yet because we don't have the results from our server. So if I go back to friends and then click edit, now this will be populated. And when I click add friend, which I should probably change the button text, it's going to fire the edit friend thing. So let's give Ryan some hype. And when I click add friend, um, that is not what it should have done. Did I not pass in the right prop? I didn't. Submit friend should now be the edit friend function that I had written. So, our server is going to refresh, undo our mistake. We will load up our friends. Let's edit Ryan. Uh, let's edit Austin. Nope, it's not liking this. Okay. 
let's load up just the friends endpoint. I will show how to get ra around this weird state issue um, in a second. So I click Edit Ryan. He shows up now that our state is populated and our find actually works. I'm going to modify his name. And when I submit this form, we see that he gets modified because it fires our put request. That put request then updates our local state to match the edited state on the server. So that's our put. Uh, questions here. Um, is using like uh, many forms is a it's okay, right? It's not too bad. If you had written two different forms, that's totally fine. I just didn't want to have to write another form component. Um, you could also, if you write friend form in this kind of um, permissive style where it you know, is, is allowed to be reused with different props, you might even want to create uh, another component called edit form that does this, what I've done in line here, you know, as its own component and then renders friend form with the appropriate props. Um, because what I've done here is basically write an ad hoc component in my render props, which is not something you should usually do. Um, I just did it here for, for the sake of speed. Um, because in fact, one way to get around using this find is if we look at our uh, readme, we can perform a get request to a specific friend. So when we load this friend form component, alternatively what we could do instead of getting the friend out of our existing state is to make a get request, get that friend's data. Um, and until we've gotten that data, we would render like a loading spinner. And then when we get it back, we render our form with some initial values that you know we got from the server. And in some ways that might be better because it makes sure we're updating the most, uh, the most updated version of that friend on the server rather than whatever we had in our local state in case we had another you know browser tab open or a different user had edited that friend so um, you can write it as a new component copy paste but um, generally we want to avoid that so writing writing friend form is a reusable component and then having it work for editing an ad just makes our application a little bit more powerful uh, so that's how I chose to do it And uh, something we could also do is if the current friend is null, we can redirect back to um, just the normal friends page to prevent that kind of weird uh, loading loop I had. So we could import redirect here. And um, if current friend is not defined, we could render our redirect. And we want to just go back to normal friends. So now if I refresh the page, it's not going to find Ryan. And we're going to get redirected back to um, the normal page. So our architecture is starting to get really messy here. I apologize for that. But um, I, I went kind of long enough as it is. So hopefully this gave you a good overview of some of the different kinds of decisions you can make here. And we could also, inside of our edit friend, once this is successfully completed, let's see, Oop. we could do a history.push to redirect us as well. I think I need to do props.history.push. Um, so we, once we're done editing the friend, it, it kicks us back. So let's edit Dustin. This email address offends me. I will edit him, and then we get redirected with the edit to Dustin. So that's all of our requests. Uh, do we have any questions here? Nope. No, no questions because you're all good, or no questions? <laughs> it was confusing i actually have a question for you yeah, so up? i was doing use context the other day and i got the login to show me a token in the console log but my payload's coming back it's undefined 
what would be like the first step for you? Because I'm, I'm, everything looks right. Um, if if it's showing in your console log, then that means it, it's probably within that response object. The, the issue might be that you're setting it into your state or your local storage incorrectly. Make sure you're setting res.data.payload. Um, what I, I suddenly realized might be the issue because I saw it earlier today is if you have a previous dot then where you, let's say console log res.data.payload or something like this and then chain your dot then where you do your, your state updating or whatever, it's actually not going to work. That's because when you chain dot thens, it uses for this argument of this dot then the return value of the previous dot then. And console log always returns undefined. So if we wanted to split this up, we would have to console log and then return res, and that would continue into our next dot then. Probably not your issue, but I wanted to mention it. No, that's cool. I got rid of the console log, and I'm, I'm using a try catch. Oh, that's and, right. You're using async await. Um, and I'm, I'm doing, uh, yeah. So I'll touch base with you later, okay. though. I'll keep messing around with it and looking at it. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, uh, any other questions here before we wrap it up? So what did we, what are we holding in our apps file? And is it pretty bare? Yeah, app uh, is just routing. And this is a common pattern that you'll see where when we have our... Uh, uh, I don't want to say single page application because that is a, a different term. When we have our, our unary uh, applications, an application with just like app renders one thing. It just like, there's no other pages. There's no routing. Then app is usually our only like higher level component. You know, the component that renders everything else. And so app is going to hold all of our state or be hooked up to Redux or whatever. And then we'll pass everything else via props. When we have a multi-page application where we have a login page and a friends page, the login page does not need to know about the friends. And the friends page does not need to do about the login other than the token we have in local storage. Um, so while we do have this component app that is higher level than both of them, they don't need to share any state. So we don't have to put our state in app. Instead, I can put my state that is relevant to my friends page within the friends component and then render sub components and do sub routing from here and basically treat this friends component like the app component was for this specific page for this specific route and my architecture has gotten really messy here but that's kind of the thing we we only need to put state as high as it needs to go Sometimes it makes our components reusable to pull it a bit higher than necessary. Like I could pull this out all into app and pass it via props, and then my friends component is nice and reusable, but I don't want it to be. Um, like my friend form, yeah, that's a good reusable component. I want to use it more than once. It's good for it to take data via props. This whole friends page that is very, very tightly tied to the logic of my friend's data and the API requests they're in, it's fine for it to keep its own state. And if we were using Redux, we would connect friends to our store directly instead of connecting app, app and passing prompts. So um, as, as our applications grow and we have multiple pages, we kind of tend to silo each of the different um, component trees that get routed out of app uh, with their own state. But app might share, you know, state between them. We're not done with that, but this is what happens is that pattern grows. You know, if I had a third page that was like books and friends could read books, then it's like, I don't want my app to hold all the data for all the friends and all the books and stuff. Like, I'll put that in the books thing. So, yeah. Uh, did that answer? Okay. Um, any other questions here? Uh, can I, I just want to verify. So a post request is used to add additional data. Yes. Whereas put request is used to, um, to change a piece of data that's in, yeah. in the, um, system. Mm -hmm. Post is for new data. Put is for modifying existing data. Technically. Uh, I, I saw this question the other day. 
technically there's not a great difference between our different types of requests because what they actually are we can see if we go into our network tab and click on one of our requests see how this header it says request method get that's all our different requests are is a literal string value in our request headers so you could like make an axios request where you just set the header with request method to get um, and that's how fetch actually works um, and it's up to the server to kind of interpret what these requests mean it it is a strong convention to use get post put and delete for their specific things you will undoubtedly at some point encounter a poorly programmed api where you use get requests for everything including deletes and adding data and stuff and that's bad because it doesn't you know the verbs don't don't match what's actually happening there um so the the purpose of these verbs is to help distinguish the different actions we take get is retrieving data post is adding new data put is modifying existing data delete delete stuff technically there's a final one called patch it doesn't see a lot of use the idea behind patch is that put in the convention technically means like modify that entire resource so like let's say i just wanted to modify dustin's name well then i wouldn't need to send you know this rest of the data here um, and that's what the patch request is for to update part of a resource to make a partial update on a resource but um, most people just use put requests for that and and it is up to the server to handle all of these requests there's no built-in logic to do any of these so most servers handle a partial update just fine under the the put request and we'll really the, a lot of the stuff with this will make sense once you've done backend and written these yourselves because it's like oh i understand the convention and the structure here because i've now had to do it uh does that answer your Thank question you. i, I okay. see okay uh all right any final questions uh i guess i have one quick one i guess mm -hmm. um it has to do with like i guess what best practices is because uh i guess you have your route which is slash from slash edit slash you know id yes colon ID. and what i ended up doing was just having a like an edit like an edit friend route and then mm -hmm. ended up passing object to it yeah like I, I set it to state and then i i pulled that object from state mm -hmm. and um i'm not sure and i i got it to work yeah. <laughs> but it is like not the best solution i guess like, that that's totally fine to have these kind of uh other routes um the reason i kind of did it with this sub routing style was because um i'm able to keep my state and within friends than within app necessarily um but uh, there's infinite ways of, of solving this exact problem. Um, and um, lots of different choices here. Uh, I just got a nosebleed. Uh, excuse me. Let me turn off my Zoom camera. Um, so the, the reason I did subrouting is, is to maintain the state within this tree. Um, you could do other methods like, you know, what Dustin showed with the, the pop-in style editing. Um, with the subrouting here, this actually isn't necessarily the best solution. You can see as I click on these edits, it's not actually changing because the way we have initial values set up, it you know only trigger on the first call to use state. Um, uh, and and with this subrouting, this technically isn't best practice because what if I change this path to like my friends? Suddenly that breaks all our subrouting. So commonly you will use people to use template strings to perform subrouting where they get the props.match.url or path in order to represent this earlier part. You could also leave this out and now this link will, link will route relative to where you currently are, but you can get some weird bugs with that. So I prefer the absolute pathing style. Um, React is not opinionated about how we do these things and we have many solutions to them react router is not the only routing solution there's tons so 
best practices are really going to be dictated by how you structure your data and what solution is going to allow you to modify and maintain that data easiest. So um, don't seek for convention until you do it a way that like feels bad with the way you have your data structured and then try to seek convention based on how you chose to structure your data or restructure your data so that you get value out of whatever convention that you found. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, all right, any final questions? And when, when did Dustin show that? Um, I don't remember. Can we, like, the replacement with the form? Um, uh, I don't remember what lecture that was, but I believe it was uh, maybe the first Redux lecture. Okay, I, thanks. I'm pretty sure okay. it was in the, uh, the Redux projects. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. All right, anything else? All right, cool. Well, then I'm going to call it for the day. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm sorry for going so far over time, but I wanted to make sure we touched on these different methods before we got into build week. So uh, thank you all so much for coming, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Henry. I appreciate thank you. it. You're thank welcome. you.